Welcome. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Simon Linnett. Most of you would have come across me, I think. I'm the chairman of this Bedfordshire Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust, and it's my duty to take you through uh, and chair this annual members meeting, uh, the second that we've had in the new constitution. Um, I think the first thing to say is uh, just to repeat, I think, some things that I heard Victoria saying before we started this meeting proper, uh, which are to do with uh, how to interact with this meeting. Uh, I think we have a slide on this, which could usefully come up. Yeah. So if you text your question uh, with your full name to that uh, number, it's Donna's number, but if you could text your question to that uh, number, that would be great. If you want to raise a hand during discussion, and that's going to be tend to be towards the end, uh, there's a raise hand icon on this facility, and uh, you could use the meeting chat icon uh, to chat in uh, a, a, a question. We will try and deal with the questions as much as we can when they come off, but we have uh, planned a short quarter of an hour at the end to pick up and sweep up any questions that we haven't. I'm very grateful to those of you who've already submitted your questions, uh, which will obviously, we will definitively try and answer. Uh, to the extent that you haven't done so, maybe you could turn uh, I think your camera's off and more importantly still mute your microphone because this just improves the quality and uh, stops you, uh, stops us hearing your instructions to your dog or whatever you're doing in, in, in the background. Um, so I think without further ado, shall we go on to the agenda? Um, we're going to start with a, a report as to how the hospital is generally doing. That's going to be led uh, I'll start off, but generally led by David and his team, David Carter and his team. Uh, we're going to have a report from the external audit. That's something we formally need to do, which is to check the accounts. And Steve Hone and the external auditors will lead on that. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the, 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 the Foundation Trust and continue on that debate about uh, how we're going forward. And then a report from the board and a report from the governors and finishing hopefully at about quarter two uh, uh, for questions and answers leading up to a seven o'clock close. That's the idea. So let's all contribute to making sure that that can work. So I think, uh, yeah, there we go. Just to remind you, I mean, this is the new Bedfordshire Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. It covers a population of around 650,000, as you can see at the top. And you can see in the middle of the bottom that obviously, on average, everybody came in. Uh, to the Somebody's got their microphone on, maybe. Please, can we turn it off? Uh, because we treated 700,000 patients uh, or patient incidents over the course of the year. We employ about 8,000 people uh, and we have a bit over 1,000 beds and we made a modest surplus in the context, as Matt will explain of a significantly larger uh, uh, revenue than 2.7 million pound uh, profit. Um, uh, we looked after 153 admitted patients and uh, 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 we uh, uh, delivered uh, into this world 8,000 babies, which is not out of kilter for what we would normally do. So. Coming on to um, the Bedfordshire Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. First full year uh, has been completed. Um, and not a particularly good welcome to our new environment. Uh, we've obviously had, uh, been under severe COVID pressures, uh, possibly us as much as virtually any other hospital. Uh, we've had bad uh, COVID experience by virtue of the nature of this population we serve. Uh, we are continuing to integrate the two hospitals as a result of the merger. Um, but most importantly, and this will be touched on, supporting the staff uh, by uh, through their health and well-being. We've achieved a financial surplus. I've just touched on that. Uh, and uh, David Hartson will join us just to remind us that there's a very significant redevelopment on both sites, uh, but particularly the acute services block on this site. We have had the disappointment of a CQC maternity report for the Bedford site, which I think Liz will t 
talk about in slightly greater detail. But even though that's a disappointment and we were rated inadequate in that specific service, uh, I think we can say that the CQC has subsequently complimented us on the way in which we have resolved uh, that, or not resolved absolutely, but we are resolving that issue. So it demonstrates the resilience of the hospital and its learning ability. And we are beginning to make a leading, play a leading role in the, the new environment of integrated care systems. So it's been a busy, busy year. This is not a hospital that in any sense of the word has been allowed to or has stood still. Um, just turning over, I'm, I'm just dealing with the um, the uh, map of the hospital and the BLMK. Uh, so the BLMK is the is the totality of the area shaded. Uh, Bedford Hospital and its hinterlanders at the top, and Dunstable towards the bottom. And I think the most important thing to say is that um, we, you know, the, the, the those who, who can see this in in, in the colour not colour blind, the blue and the orange uh, we do take hospitals from outside a few from uh, a relative few from Milton Keynes paradoxically even though they're in the same uh, uh, STP or ICS or ICB as it moves through the various progressions of constitution but much more uh, patients and you know these arrows could be shown going each way from the Lister at Stevenage and this is um, part of the complexity of the dynamic of creating a single STP. We cannot go into too much of detail on this but because it would take the full time, but trying to work out these patient flows in the context of that, uh, in that, in that geography is one of the things we are, we are trying to work our way through with um, the other ICS partners. I think that's by enough by way of introduction. I'm going to pass over now to, 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 to the Chief Executive, uh, David Carter, who's just going to take us through some of those issues in slightly greater detail. So, David. Thanks, Simon. Uh, if you can just move to the next slide. Yes, so uh, obviously Simon referenced our, our, our integration on the 1st of April 2020. Um, that was right in the middle of COVID and uh, in terms of the first wave and therefore um, uh, that was obviously a difficult and challenging time but the transition itself in terms of uh, a transition to the new corporate entity I think progressed smoothly despite COVID um, and since then we have in, uh, progressed our integration at some pace. So some of the uh, key elements of that integration have been firstly the cross-site leadership. We uh, wanted to and were committed to ensuring that we had cross-site clinical uh, general management and nursing leadership in order to really see the benefits of the merger. So having that, that single leadership across the two sites and that's now in place with our clinical directors, lead nurses and general managers who have been in those posts for some considerable time since the start of the, of the merger. And that's now, I think we're really seeing the benefits of that in terms of the collaboration between the two hospitals. Uh, we've got our corporate teams coming together and that includes the cross-site quality and patient safety team. And I think that's really important in terms of some of that learning across site. Um, those um, individual specialties are developing their service integration strategies. We made a, uh, a strong commitment at the time of the merger that we would only develop our service strategy once we had merged. And that was a deliberate uh, and positive move because we wanted our clinical teams to come together before we developed our service strategies, and that's now happening, and that's now happening with our clinical teams. And also, uh, um, finally, just to mention our digital strategy, um, we've put money aside as part of the merger process in order to bring together our, our, our systems, which are obviously different in some of, the, some of the two sites. We've done that in places. So for example, pathology was the first one to go with a single pathology system now across the two sites. And we see the uh, need to bring those systems together as key to uh, ensuring that we develop the most from our integration process. Uh, the next slide, please. There was a question just, David, on, on 111 services. I don't know whether you've seen that. Uh, no, I've not seen that question. Right. Um, I can it, pick that up, Simon, just, if 
depth of my uh, reference to um, the. Okay, you'll pick that up later, and the and 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 okay. and you know the the, the ill health produced uh, by various fast food restaurants, which is something that I know you are tackling. So maybe we can just cover it in that terms through the Bedfordshire Care Alliance, which is the integration of our, our two hospitals in Bedfordshire and those who provide the. Uh, the mental health facilities and the community health facilities and the local authorities uh, where we are trying, or David is trying, who leads that group to uh, uh, to uh, address this issue of the fact that uh, there are many things out there in society that are making us generally less healthy. So we are addressing that point. So yes, go on if you would, David, I beg your pardon. Y yes, so the slide, um, so some of um, the benefits that we're now seeing as part of that merger. So I think the first thing to say is that whilst COVID clearly was 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 a major uh, challenge, uh, whilst we navigate our way through the, the the merger process, in fact, I think that actually we immediately saw some of the benefits of two hospitals working together, providing mutual aid between the two hospitals. And PPE was an obvious example, certainly in the early way, in the early uh, first wave when uh, PPE supplies were uh, enormously stretched. And we 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 made sure that we balanced some of that across the two sites, and and I was successful in doing that. We never we never ran out of PPE all during the COVID experience, and and part of uh, the reason for that was our ability to to flex between the two sites. I think the recruitment of clinical staff has improved. Um, clinical staff have been more attracted to uh, the potential of working for a large organisation with more opportunities and more more areas for development. So I think that's definitely been a benefit. Uh, we've shared learning from incidents across the site. So when we now have an incident on one site, we share that learning not just on the single hospital site, but right across the trust. I think that's a big benefit. Uh, we've seen some of the financial savings that we predicted pre-merger accruing, some relatively straightforward ones for the fact that Matt now has a single financial ledger rather than the two ledgers that we had. And the single financial ledger is, is, is less expensive than two separate ones. So um, some of those... Uh, Ease, relatively easy corporate savings have come. Some of the uh, uh, more difficult and challenging ones come from our clinical synergies we're, we're, are still playing their way out. Uh, I think a big project right from the start was the insourcing of pathology at Bedford back from the private sector. Uh, that was achieved in the summer of 2020 and uh, I think was a major success in terms of and now really allowing us to reconfigure our pathology services and also the significant savings associated with bringing, that, with bringing that back from the private sector. In terms of our ability to deal with uh, both COVID and our recovery, uh, it does allow us to flex um, between the two sites. So balancing where we've got long waiters, uh, looking at where we've got capacity on the two sites and using that appropriately. But also in relation to more recently, in relation to COVID, uh, we have been using the fact that we uh, have got the two critical care units on the two hospitals to balance that critical care demand and make sure that we uh, we always have a bit of headroom in terms of capacity. That's been really difficult, but uh, um, we've, we've, we've done that on numerous occasions. So these are just some, some examples of some of the benefits we have from two hospitals working together and, and definitely over the past 18 months, I think we've definitely seen that we've been uh, stronger uh, and more than the sum of our parts. Just moving on to, I think, what is our biggest worry in many ways, which is our staff health and well-being. At the start of the COVID experience, um, we had we, we we could see the staff had lots of energy, adrenaline, and um, um, that resilience, and that certainly saw us through the early part of COVID. But as things now, we get into the period where we've be, we've been, and as a trust, as Asana mentioned, we've been one of the more hard hit uh, trusts. We can certainly see that we uh, have a lot of fatigue tiredness and um, and keeping the morale up of the staff has been incredibly difficult. Some of the ways that we've done that, we have uh, made sure that, uh, that we had our staff hubs through COVID. So they were areas that staff could rest and uh, recuperate, where we could um, have a focal point for giving out some of the food and kind donations that we had from the community. Uh, we also had our thank you events um, uh, last year. They had to be virtual, but um, um, I think uh, there are a way of, of saying thank you to our staff in the usual way. And we've also had Project Wingman, which was the uh, project that was set up by um, some of the flight crews that were not able to work on COVID. Uh, we had the Project Wingman bus that was on site uh, earlier this year 
uh, for a week on both sites and, and again providing a, an area for our staff to uh, rest and recuperate but I think that remains a, a, um, a big concern for us as we head off into the winter now of keeping our staff in a good place keeping them uh, their uh, morale up is is right at the top of our agenda I think our staff have done an absolutely amazing job over the past 18 months and really shown their resilience so we want to do everything we can and I hope that next summer we'll be able to get back to our uh, staff engagement events and and that really allows us to give staff a bit of time out give them um, uh, some reward for what they've been doing and say thank you to them. Next slide please. Uh, so just a little bit on finance um, so the, the trust now is a, a very large organization with a turnover of 685 million we did finish last year with a small surplus as Simon mentioned but also I think I'd like to highlight the, the, that number on the right which is we've invested 58 million pounds of capital in our in our infrastructure on both sites which is just a, a shows the amount of investment that we're putting into making both sites uh, <coughs> for the future I think I'm going to have pass over to uh, external audit and Steve Holm. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, well, I've got a relatively simple tale to tell. Um, as you can see from the slide, the external auditors were able to give us a clean report on both our fi financial sustainability, our governance with no governance, and through um, e improving economy efficiency and effectiveness, um, with no significant weaknesses found. Um, I think that's in no small part due to the efforts of Matt and his team, who have not only had two teams, uh, two systems on two sites to bring together to produce that result, but also, of, as uh, David's already touched upon, introduced a new financial system. And also, I have to say, to the efforts of KPMG, our auditors, who, of course, in a large part, have had to do this remotely um, over, over the airwaves. So um, with that in mind, I'll pass over to Katie Scott it, briefly to see if she has any comments she wishes to make on the audit. Thanks very much, Steve. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm just um, pulled over in my car. Um, unfortunately, I had an unknowledge on a meeting first, in person meeting I've got. Um, but no, I think Steve, you said it all. Um, I think it was a positive experience in terms of we the audit was delivered on time. Um, and as you say, I think it was a new challenge this year with um, the, the ledger coming in sort of mid-year. Um, and also I was I came into the audit late as well, so uh, Matt's team had to deal with a new engagement manager, um, which is can often cause turmoil. But um, no, it was a really, really smooth process. So I echo thanks to uh, Matt and, um, and his team. Okay, thanks. So I'll hand over to Kathy for the next part of the presentation. Thanks very much, Steve. So I'll um, just very quickly um, talk about the, the, the COVID experience for the sites on, on the basis that really we, we couldn't talk about the year with, without including that. It has been an extraordinary health emergency, but the teams have focused and pulled together and, and really showed a level of commitment and, and teamwork beyond anything that I've ever experienced in, in my career. Um, some of the positives are around COVID have been the focus on staff wellbeing and, and making sure that we are providing hubs and, and support through clinical psychology um, and just really in, encouraging uh, colleagues to, to look out for each other and, and to ask whether you're okay. Um, so that has been something that we, we've really seen um, staff rising to the challenge on that. We've also had amazing community engagement and some of the relationships that have built up through the COVID crisis, I think will stand us in good stead in the future. Simon alluded to the, the Bedfordshire Care Alliance um, and some of our relationships with local authorities, community services, which have really been strengthened um, both as, as part of the merger and, and the COVID response. Um, the vaccination programme, you know, from a, a standing start um, to, to vaccinate, you know, thousands of NHS staff, both for our own organisation, um, and our, our local authority and, and community and, and mental health partners um, has just been an incredible logistical um, and, and clinical effort and, and, you know, really can't thank the, the teams that delivered that enough. Um, and then more latterly, as we approach the end of uh, the, the financial year, as we look towards recovery and um, involvement in the Accelerator programme, which was part of a national pilot, that has also been a huge success. 
And increasingly, we are restarting, re-engaging, redesigning our, our business as usual, BAU um, systems and, and processes to, to work in, in the new normal um, as we start increasingly to, to think about um, what NHS services post-COVID should look like. So just to remind everybody the, the scale of, of what we dealt with, um, these graphs um, just show you the shape of the prevalence curves and, and some of the periods in, in which we were hardest hit. Back in March 2020, there wasn't much in the way of testing going on, so very low community prevalence recorded. But you can see, um, you know, back in, in June 2020, where we, we really peaked in terms of incidence. Um, this is cases per 100,000 population. It dropped back down and, and uh, in May and, and through into um, autumn last year, we were, um, we, 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 this year, sorry, we, we were starting to recover. And, and then unfortunately, we've seen the, the, the spike in incidents again this summer. So it, it's been very stop start for staff. And, and David referred to the, the fatigue. We've been dealing with this for um, a long time now. And, and um, you know, it, it, it's quite difficult when, you know, just as things get up and running again, we have to slow things down and, and, and change policies in, in terms of new guidance. We just move on to the next um, slide. So as a, at today or yesterday, um, we're just under 70 positive patients across the two sites, 11 of which are in critical care. That compares to a peak of uh, over 370 patients back in January uh, this year. Um, and so you can see it's, it's a very different scale of, of inpatient prevalence that we're dealing with now. We are doing everything we can to make sure that um, our recovery progress isn't impeded by uh, the, the, the current COVID situation and are keeping our pathways separate, keeping our workforce separate where we need to. We are having some challenges. It's difficult for patients to come for surgery. They're having to have swabs. Um, we are finding surprise positives and we still have a lot of staffing pressure. Um, so it's not as smooth running as, as things were pre-pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the hospitals and feel much more like business as usual um, at the moment than they have done at any other point since the merger. Um, and our staffing absence, um, as I mentioned, is still impacting diagnostics and outpatients. What we've been trying to do is make sure that we keep our theatres running and our day case activity through endoscopy units and so on, because that's the hardest activity to, to provide in other ways. Um, unfortunately, the non-COVID urgent and emergency care pressures do continue um, and both our emergency departments have had record-breaking days in, in recent months. And I think one of the questions we've had is about whether we're, we're resizing our hospitals to manage the changes in the way patients are accessing their GP services. And I, I just want to reassure um, members that actually the focus with the Bedfordshire Care Alliance and our local authority and, and system partners is very much about keeping patients out of hospital wherever we can. So we're not resizing hospitals to, to uh, absorb um, demand for, from GPs, but we're working to help make sure that patients can access services in different ways, including NHS 111 and community pharmacies. Um, in terms of uh, our accelerator progress, so this was a a national pilot. We were one of seven um, integrated care systems involved in this. And it was really looking how, how much better could we do um, if we tried to do things differently. It's been challenging because of staff absence, but our clinicians have really risen to the challenge. Um, we did deliver over 100% of elective inpatient activity for a period of four to five weeks um, before the COVID, COVID absences picked up again. And we're submitting a number of case studies to help other systems learn from our experience um, and understand what we're trying to do with theatre productivity and scheduling. Unfortunately, our waiting list is much bigger than it was pre-pandemic. And um, we've gone from zero patients waiting over 52 weeks pre-pandemic at, at both the, the sites to unfortunately um, over 2,200. And you can see perhaps it's sorry, it's quite small, but the shape of that yellow line in the top um, chart, just, just showing what's happened for patients waiting over 52 weeks. It has gone down, but unfortunately it will start to go up again. Um, part of the reduction is because we didn't receive new GP referrals in anything like our normal volumes this time last year as we were in the height of the first wave. Um, and so it, it will start to go up again, but uh, I think 
um, it shows the, the scale of the recovery challenge that we have. The other thing is, unfortunately, our di diagnostic waiting times, we've got a huge backlog and reduced capacity um, because of needing to um, distance and, and manage flow. Um, so we're not delivering our routine diagnostic tests with the sort of time scale that we were pre-COVID. And our challenge is now all about trying to get back to that, that previous level of performance. Um, one of the questions we received was um, about the difficulty that um, a member is having with not knowing when his wife, um, for whom he's a, a carer and a support, um, might, when that surgery might be scheduled. Um, and I think I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the difficulty um, that many of our patients are having because we're really finding it very difficult to give um, times at the moment. Um, but what we are trying to do is give people as much notice as we possibly can and work with patients to make sure that we understand um, their special needs and offer options. So offering other alternatives to surgery um, or, or surgery to, to take place at an independent sector provider if, uh, if patients are suitable for that. Um, so just ask if there are any concerns to, to keep in touch with the clinical team caring for um caring for your wife and and uh, obviously all of our attention is focused on getting those long waiters listed as soon as we possibly can okay um, sounds like a pretty grisly uh, report from kathy and of course it is in any normal context but i think it's important to emphasize without diluting our enthusiasm to improve that we believe that we are faring as well as any hospital that we can easily see the statistics for in the east of England or hospital group. Um, and I just would repeat what's been said before, the effort of our staff in achieving that is frankly quite remarkable. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I think we're handing over to Liz now, who's going to follow on. Thanks, Cathy. Um, as Cathy has already touched on the phenomenal effort of the vaccination hubs that were set up across both hospital sites um, in January this year and I really don't want to understate the massive challenge that our staff um, stepped up to and not only did we have the opportunity to vaccinate our staff we also had the opportunity to vaccinate some of our other partner staff health and social care staff but also some of our local communities and we couldn't have done it without our doctors, nurses, therapists, pharmacists, admin staff and our volunteers um, coming in and doing it on top of their day job. And I'm really pleased to say, you know, from the staff, our staff perspective, we have got a really high proportion of our staff um, double vaccinated. Um, and it was a huge team effort. And um, we learned a lot from that experience. And it was a and it was a fantastic collaborative um, exercise with our partners. Next slide, please. I want to touch on the um, more challenging aspects of the pandemic. One of the things that was really challenging for all of our patients, our relatives and our staff during the pandemic were the, were the visiting restrictions that were put in place from a national perspective um, very, very early on. And so going back to the beginning of the pandemic, the restrictions were um, quite, uh, well, they were very restrictive. There was only visiting for um, end of life care, um, women in established labor and guardian or parent of a child in pediatrics. During that time, we set up um, visitors helpline during the first and the second wave to help deal with some of the challenges around making sure we were able to communicate with relatives, communicate with external partners, but also facilitating patients the, uh, to communicate with their relatives. Um, this was extremely challenging and it didn't always go as we would like to have gone. What we have done um, over the last four to five months is try to slowly introduce visitors back onto site, particularly on our adult inpatient wards, the majority of our adult inpatient wards. So where we are at the moment is we have um, visitors, we can have a visitor on for one hour per day on our adult inpatient wards. Now there's some caveats to that. What we, what we suggest um, is that our visitors have a lateral flow test before they come on site. Obviously they're giving guidance and um, some, 
some pointers around the use of PPE, um, and they can stay for one hour per day. That's proved really successful. And despite some challenges um, around making sure we keep everybody safe, because we, we're still in the pandemic, um, that's proved really successful. And actually, we can really see the benefit for our, uh, our patients and our relatives, particularly from a communication perspective. So getting updates on plans, medical plans, but also discharge plans has pr proven hugely beneficial. From a maternity perspective, we've extended our visiting to two hours on the postnatal ward, all stages of labour, and now we're looking at increasing that to four hours a day on the postnatal ward. There are exceptions. Our ED departments are really constrained from a space perspective. And um, so visiting or accompanying people with um, people attending the ED department in the waiting areas is still restricted because unfortunately we can't social distance apart from exceptions that are dictated by the clinical teams in the department. We are, we are, we remain restricted with our outpatients as well. We are looking to see how we can do some risk-based assessments on allowing accompaniment to outpatients appointments. But unfortunately at the moment, we still have the restrictions in place with our um, outpatient clinics where we're not at maximum capacity because we can't safely social distance in the waiting room. So we are constantly reviewing and looking at how we can increase capacity also allow more people on site, um, it, particularly when accompanying other people. The infection control element has been the key driver to some of these restrictions. Uh, as many of you know, the, the, the COVID-19 virus is very transmissible. In old hospital buildings, it can be very challenging from an infection control perspective. And the fundamental principles or some of the restrictions that are in place is around keeping our staff, our patients and our communities and relatives safe. One of the things that has happened in the pandemic, uh, recognising the importance of um, our infection control teams, who have obviously been key players in keeping us all safe and moving during the pandemic from a hospital perspective. We've um, increased our infection control nursing cohort across both sites. So since the beginning of the year, we've had a seven day nursing service to help provide advice and guidance to all of our clinical and operational teams, which helps us manage the site more carefully. We swab all patients that come in as an emergency on admission. We swab patients on day three, day five and on day seven and beyond and before they're discharged from hospital. And we staff all of our, we swab all of our clinical staff once a week, either using lateral flow or point prevalence um, which is run by our swabbing team. So the main priorities for infection control um, has been very, um, the, the clinical teams have been working very closely with the operational and clinical teams to keep everybody safe. We have had some outbreaks um, on some of the wards. It's a feature of a global pandemic, unfortunately, but the teams Priority is always to keep everybody safe and make sure we reduce that risk wherever possible. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to move on to maternity on the Bedford site now. So we had a maternity CQC inspection, um, which was unannounced on the Bedford site in November last year. Um, maternity at Bedford had probably struggled for a couple of years. They've had a couple of ratings of requires improvement. Um, one of the things that we did notice around summer, the summertime last year, is that we were really challenging, uh, challenged with some of our mid midwifery um, staffing levels. Some of that was because of the pandemic and staff were unable to work. Some staff were shielding and some of it was associated with vacancy. We'd already identified this as a risk as an organisation, and we had already started putting measures in place to address some of these. For example, we had already appointed a director of midwifery in October last year, and we'd already appointed a joint clinical director across maternity and obstetric services, <clears throat> and both of those posts straddled both sides. We also increased our 
cohort of specialist midwives ahead of the CQC inspection. However, it takes some time for some of these posts to, um, to come into the organisation. But I think we, already, we did already have plans in place. So when the CQC came in after some concerns that had been raised in the summer of last year, we were rated as inadequate. So on a positive note, we already have made some plans to address some of the concerns that we uh, were aware of from a staffing perspective. And we have been since then working with our CQC colleagues and our regional colleagues to get uh, the bedroom maternity services to a much better place. And I'm really pleased to say that since then, we've appointed 10 new specialist midwives, um, a new head of midwifery. We have got 30 new midwives starting in the next couple of weeks and two additional consultants. When the CQC came back in at the beginning of June, the while they didn't re-rate the service because it wasn't a re-rated inspection, they did absolutely acknowledge um, the efforts and the work that the and the impact of that work and the individuals in our service that, that had been made um, for the improvements around the maternity services. Uh, I think I'm going to hand over to David now. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, we've had a very busy year in redevelopment. Uh, we've moved from a scenario of showing you sketches and drawings to actual photographs of works, and we'll see some of those in a minute. Um, the key highlights of the year are that we're about to submit the full business case for the new clinical buildings. Uh, this is a, the last hurdle that we need to get through towards starting work on site. Um, demolition is underway at the L&D. Um, if you want to have a last look at Building 28, get there quickly because there's a large machine there that's taking it down uh, as we speak. Um, the energy centre is under construction. The steel frame's gone up. Um, we put a new flue up uh, and we will shortly start to put in the major electrical plants and equipment that we need to, to really change the way we support the site. Um, Bedford, we're doing a lot of work at Bedford at the moment, um, largely around planning, looking at the infrastructure, looking at what we need to have in place to support any future de developments on, on those sites. And in parallel with all of this, we took on the urgent and emergency care program. Um, the works at Bedford are complete. The works at Luton are much more complicated as we're dealing with refurbishment of a, a very old building. Um, but they're starting to gain momentum now and we'll see some real progress at the end of the year. Next slide. Is it worth just reminding people, David, that it's a, it's a very big project, particularly due to we're doubling the size of the emergency department while operating an emergency service? Yes, well, um, I mean, effectively, we can't reduce capacity at all. So we have to add a bit before we can move a bit. Um, it's a it's a very complicated jigsaw uh, that we're working through. Here, these are some photographs of some projects that we've completed this year. Um, we've got the dementia garden at the Bedford site, which has been a huge change up there, which I think is really appreciated. We've got the new car park at the L and D, uh, and the feedback from that has been terrific. Uh, the new office block uh, where we've uh, where most people are now uh, based, that's had sort of differing views, but I think people are settling down in there and it's beginning to pay dividends in terms of the engagement between staff that it offers. And the ED ex extension at the Bedford site is now completed um, and operational. So those are some key steps that we've got through and underway at the moment is the next slide. So we talked about demolition. Um, the uh, demolition of the Trust HQ is underway. Uh, the, the picture at the top right is the is an image of what the site will look like in three years time when the main works are completed. So you've got the main acute services block in the middle and you can get a sense of the size of that by seeing the surgical block alongside and then it's surrounded by the new wall block and the energy centre. The energy centre is sort of bottom uh, left, the flue's up, the steel frames up, the concrete's been poured, uh, and next week we'll see the plants and equipment going in. And then the ED scheme at the L&D 
you can't really get a sense of just how much work has been done in this building over the past six months. We've removed a huge amount of redundant services. Um, with, there's been an absolute bird's nest of cables that we've had to negotiate our way through. But we're seeing the end of that, and that work is really going to start uh, moving forward with a vengeance now. So I'll hand over now to David. Thanks. Um, so just a little bit about what, what um, our priorities are for 21-22. Uh, that continued investment in the sites that David is talking about and the hopefully the uh, approval of the business case and um, we will want to start in this uh, financial year in terms of breaking ground on acute services block. Uh, in relation to the ongoing integration post-merger, our clinical teams are working on that actively. So we have some service strategies we've already agreed. Others are coming to fruition. Um, clearly maintaining our quality and financial performance and maintaining that discipline on all of all fronts is, is very important for us. But that recovery from COVID obviously is, is right at the top of our agenda in terms of getting our waiting list back to some sort of uh, uh, stability and uh, acceptable position, which they clearly are not in now. I'd also just like to mention sustainability. We have um, we've established in 2021 a new sustainability committee. Uh, we're absolutely committed to trying doing everything we can to make ourselves a much greener organisation. And the Energy Centre that David referred to, uh, whilst not completely um, um, uh, carbon neutral, does move us into a much better position in terms of our use of energy on the site. Um, and finally, digital integration remains a big priority for us as we try and get the, the systems across both sites to talk to each other, but also to continue our, our programme investment uh, to really build on the, the status of both hospitals as GD, as global digital exemplar sites. That, those schemes are now finished, but we need to build on those and um, really develop our, our digital capabilities. Next slide, please. And so in terms of things for the future, um, leading the Bedfordshire Care Alliance, that's, uh, as Simon mentioned that, that's really our way of trying to influence what's, uh, not just what's in the hospital, what's outside the hospital. Most of what we do in the health service is responding uh, to ill health. Uh, but what we really now are shifting our focus to do is to look at the, the, you know, the key determinants of health. And that means working with the local authorities um, and really getting involved in some of their strategies around housing, employment, um, and, you know, things like air quality, which really make a difference in terms of people's health. Uh, the Bedfordshire Care Alliance, which is an alliance of all the statutory organisations across Bedfordshire, is our way of doing that, doing that and we're leading that Bedfordshire Care Alliance. We also see that potentially being a vehicle for devolution of funding from the CCGs as they uh, trans, uh, transition to become ICSs. And we're very keen to do that. We're very keen to take responsibility for the budget for health for Bedfordshire, uh, uh, together with our partners, uh, Cambridge Community Services and East London Foundation Trust as the statutory providers of health in, in, in the sector. Uh, we want to um, use our critical mass to really help do that and also recognise that uh, the, the trust is, is a major influence on uh, the, local, uh, the local economy. So we're a, we're a major employer and the jobs we have are good jobs and well-paid jobs. So we have a massive impact on the, um, on the economies of, our, of Bedfordshire. We're forming collaboratives with other uh, uh, providers. Um, so, for example, with East and North Hearts, uh, we are trying to... Uh, uh, look to the future in terms of the future for Mount Vernon as part of the cancer network, um, looking to how we collaborate uh, across uh, acute providers for our, our population. So not just within BLMK, our ICS, but outside our ICS with our other partners. Uh, we clearly want to become uh, and achieve an outstanding rating as an acute provider um, and we'll continue to do everything we can to improve the quality of our services. And finally, therefore, the completion of the redevelopment of both sites as part of our future strategy. So that's what the future looks like for us. And I'm now going to hand back to Simon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I'm just going to start now winding up to a uh, conclusion uh, with having uh, dealt with what the hospital's doing. And uh, as part of that is obviously the governance arrangements, uh, which the board oversees of how it's all uh, delivered. 
I think the first thing to say about uh, the board is uh, to pat ourselves slightly on the back because at the beginning of the year, and I'm talking about the year that's 2021, um, 2021 in other words, uh, uh, the, the, the year started in April of 2020, uh, we were almost told that we didn't have to do any governance, um, that governance could be suspended, uh, that's over, slightly overstating it, while we were hitting that worst peak phase of COVID and we had no idea what we were doing. We, we made it governance light, but I, I, a tribute to the whole board and much more tribute to those executives who supported the board uh, that we managed to, I think, at all stages through the crisis, have a very good command of what was actually going on. So I don't think we ever lost sight of, of what was being delivered. That's the board. Um, Sadly, uh, uh, we will be saying goodbye to Richard Minton, who will be retiring. He chooses to retire at the end of this month, at the end of September. Uh, uh, no, sorry, at the end of the year, at the end of December. Beg your pardon, Richard, if you're on. Uh, he's been a great contributor. He's, uh, he's uh, chaired the Workforce Committee. Uh, the nature of the board is, of course, to remind you is that there has to be a majority of non-executive directors uh, on a foundation trust board and you will be rapidly able to see that we're at parity, eight each, but that's maintained by me having a casting vote if in the very remote circumstance we actually ever take a board decision uh, by vote. Normally the board decides collectively uh, uh, and we don't have to rely on the arcane process of, of, of creating a board. It's a stable board and I don't think it's significantly changed other than the addition of people from Bedford in the last two years. And I think that's been a great strength over uh, this very difficult period. Uh, we are, of course, as a non-executive board, at any rate, that top slice of that uh, slide you previously saw, are recruited by the governors, the governors that you, the members, appoint to that role. And in that context, we've seen quite a significant uh, change uh, Helen Lucas, who will come on in a moment, has been absolute giant uh, in terms of her, her delivery of a very complicated and convoluted and complex uh, debate about how to make the number of governors uh, more reflective of the scale of the hospital. We started by just adding governors for Bedford because Bedford didn't come with any governors, governors because it wasn't a foundation trust, so we created that. Uh, governor's positions, but then we felt we should slim down. So as a result, we now have, as you can see from this slide, 21 uh, public governors, uh, and that uh, has been done with great tolerance, with great discipline, and with great uh, 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 determination. Uh, and the governor elections have just been held, and Helen will just touch on how that's actually gone on the ground. So we have 21 public governors uh, now, um, uh, and we have 12, as you can see in that table, uh, uh, staff governors uh, uh, in the various disciplines across the two sites. So this is done by site, uh, particularly the previous one is done largely by geography. Um, so uh, we, have, um, um, a, 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 we have undertaken a significant uh, restructuring of the governors, and I commend that to you. Uh, it was approved, I think, about a month ago at the governor's meeting, and I commend to you the, 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 the new structure which reflects the size of the organisation and the range of the services uh, that we offer in each territory. Uh, we said goodbye to two, um, four, sorry, four, uh, uh, two governors and two people who effectively were chosen by governors essentially. So we said goodbye in a more permanent sense. They, they sadly died to Jack Wright and Ray Gunning, who had been uh, governors uh, for, uh, I think, both of them for nine years. Indeed, Jack Wright, I think, had come back and was just starting a uh, second visit. He was particularly interested in the place inspection agenda. Ray Gunning did a lot of work in patient experience and particularly in and around latent buzzard GPs. We also sadly lost Spencer Colvin, uh, 
just only a month or so ago in July, who was the chair, essentially the chair before me. He'd done four years and you had appointed him into that role uh, and worked very closely with you. Not quite in the same category, but Brian Woodrow, who was a major figure at Bedford, passed away also in July, uh, having run the hospital's charity and made a major contribution to the raising of £10 million for the Primrose unit. There are many other people that we should just reflect on that we have lost from the hospital, but those are the people that most closely relate to you, the members, because essentially, in, in, in essentially you have put those people into their positions from which they sadly have now very permanently left. It's a great sadness to us, uh, but uh, there are many other sadnesses out there, we feel, for all of those people, all of those people who are no longer with us as a result of this uh, crisis or just as a result of the passage of time over this year. I'm going to, I think, pass over now to uh, to Helen, who will fill in some of that detail. Helen, your lead gov governor. Thank you, Simon. Um, if I can just start by showing you the uh, full Council of Governors. So this is the Council of Governors, the numbers that Simon has just alluded to. And the this shows the public governors within the multicolors at the top and then the staff governors in the pink. And within that, then we have some re-elected governors and we also have some new governors joining us. If we can just focus on the new governors, then on the next slide, you can see that we have three governors from Central Bedfordshire, Dr. Michael Carter, Pat Quartermain and Debbie Gardner. From Luton, one new governor, Wendy Cook. From Hertfordshire, one Dr. Dylan Joshi. And then the three members who you can see at the, at the bottom are staff governors. So we are joined by one member of the medical and dental constituency, which is Mr. Dimpu Bagawati, a non-clinical staff member, Hina Safar, and staff in the professional and technical group, which is Terence Hayes-Smith. And I'd like to welcome you all and look forward to seeing you and joining us in the Council of Governors and working with you. So welcome. One of our main um, responsibilities and statutory duties as a governor is to hold the non-exec directors to account for the performance of the trust board and we do this by utilizing the opportunities we have to meet with the non-exec directors as governors in various forums such as the trust committees where we have a governor representation and there's also a link non-exec director we also have several meetings where which are attended by both the non-exec directors and the governors. We also, the non-exec directors attend the formal Council of Governors meetings and present to them subjects on their, many of their portfolios. And this is an opportunity for a very robust and connected dialogue with the Council of Governors and the NEDs so that we make sure that we can hold them to account. A further statutory duty of the Council of Governors is the appointment of the non-exec directors as Simon has previously mentioned and also one of the other roles is to extend and approve any extension of their terms of office and as we can see from the next slide then we have had some approvals from the um, within the within the non-exec directors so Simon Limit, the chair, we have extended his con his term of office to September 2022. And then we have four non-exec directors named here who have extended their terms of office to the dates you can see on the slide. Uh, Simon's already mentioned the resignation of Richard Minton. And therefore, as, uh, as governors, then we will be, we have already initiated the recruitment process um, for both a replacement of the non-exec director and also, sadly, the chair for Simon next September. So moving on, just, a re just an overview really of our governors and members. So we have a significant increase in our public members when we merged in 2020, and this has taken us up to now 16,000 plus within the public constituencies. Um, we have over 9,000 staff members, but that's across both the Luton and the Bedford sites. 
and we have 38 governors in total who represent these members and that includes 13 staff governors and also the five appointed governors, three from the councils and two from universities. So we are quite a, a large group, but with representing quite a large number of members. And that's our job to represent the public, the stakeholders and the staff and make sure there is that dialogue two way to, to ensure that the running of the hospital is robust. In previous years, we have supported community engagement and obviously due to the pandemic, then this has perhaps been a little bit curtailed, but we hope to resume that in 2022 with the reintroduction of the medical lectures. So we should be looking forward to those. As Simon's already said, we achieved our reduction plan and we have just as a Council of Governors approved an interim membership strategy, which was brought to the brought to the council from the membership group um, focusing on our ways of increasing membership, especially in Bedford Borough and Central Bedfordshire. So finally, if I could just recap on the results of the elections for this year that have just com been completed. So these are the public cons constituencies and in the centre column, this shows the people who have either been re-elected or newly elected with each, within each of the public constituencies. And on the right hand column are the governors who are either unsuccessful in this election. So sadly, we will be saying goodbye to these um, governors who have served for the varying number of years and also people who decided not to stand. And then within the staff and appointed governors, the same sort of table we have in the middle common in the middle column, sorry, then we have um, some of the re-elected or newly elected governors and the same, the people who decided not to stand on the right hand column. So thank you very much. And we look forward to working together as a group of, as a council of governors for the following year. And now I think I hand back to Simon. Uh, which is so neat. Uh, really, before we pass this over to the questions that we've already received and any other questions that you wish to put to us, um, just to uh, slightly, I suppose, personalise uh, that which Helen has just said. I mean, we've had immense support from, from governors and um, sadly, it doesn't go on indefinitely. Uh, we, we, we say goodbye uh, because they have completed nine years to Dorothy uh, Ferguson, who has, we're all, as Ned's particularly beholden to, because she chaired the uh, the uh, recruitment committee for the governors, and Derek Smith, who is, uh, has been redoubtable in terms of his commitment to checking, checking that the hospital is well pre presented. Um, Roger Turner, who was lead governor, completed his eight years, uh, uh, and including another one as a non-voting uh, governor, so certainly made a major commitment to to the hospital. Um, others slightly sh shorter periods: uh, Susan Doherty, Don Atkinson, and Williams, who is uh, still uh, who has risen in her responsibilities within the hospital in terms of her executive responsibilities, and Ritik Ritik Banerjee, who chairs the medical staff committee for. Luton. All of those again have done uh, a major service. Um, others maybe we, we, we would have hoped might have continued. Malcolm Rainbow, uh, Keith Barter, Dave Allen and Matthew Tanner, but such is that the process of elections that they have been in, in most cases cut short before their time, but nonetheless have done an, an immense um, role for us. It's a very interesting relationship between the board and the governors. The, and it, I, I, I would just like to say how well, in general terms, I think both sides respect it. Uh, the governors appoint the non-executive directors and ultimately the non-executives, by, partly by being in the majority, uh, uh, appoint the broader board. And uh, they, uh, the, the, uh, the, the governors having appointed us can obviously disappoint us, uh, get rid of us, uh, but in, in, in more conventional terms, as, as we've said, hold us to account. So 
uh, even in major decisions, uh, don't technically have the right to overrule us in terms of the decisions we take, but certainly uh, ensure that they are listened to and that we are respectful of them who, who after all, ultimately represent the view of you, the membership, and more broadly of the community in terms of the way in which the hospital runs itself and increasingly participates in a broader community agenda. And so I can't commend highly enough the way in which the governors perform their roles. Um, I don't think there's anything specific I want to raise uh, now, but we have a number of questions that have come in, uh, some that came in uh, ahead of this meeting, which we can address, and some that have come in uh, through the process of uh, the chat room and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, that mechanism. And so I'm going to start off, before I open it up to people to put up their hands, to address, I think it's about five or six or seven questions that have come in. Uh, the first is to do with paying for car parking and why uh, it's sensible that people can pay for car parking. I'm going to pass that over to Matt uh, uh, to just answer that general question. Hi, thanks, Simon. Um, so uh, sadly, if we didn't charge for car parking, um, we'd have an issue where the, the demand for car parking would dramatically exceed our, our, our capacity. Um, so we uh, we charge for car parking to incentivise people who can uh, travel to the hospital in hospitals in different ways, uh, either via public transport or being dropped off or, or by bike or, or foot um, to do so. Um, as David mentioned earlier, this also supports our sustainability agenda. So uh, encouraging people to travel to hospitals in other ways uh, helps us become more green and sustainable. Um, the second part of the question um, asked uh, the hospital would have the money back if the hospital was in charge of the car parking. Um, just wanted to confirm that the hospital is in charge of the car parking. We receive all of that income uh, directly into the hospital and then reinvest that into patient care. The second question that we had in before the meeting started uh, was to do with a memorial garden for staff lost. Uh, we have the beginnings of a memorial garden, as I think David uh, Hartson put on the top left, if I remember its positioning of his uh, completed slide. Uh, that was true. We have completed a uh, dementia garden outside the front entrance to Bedford, but I think the intention is to extend that and particularly to commemorate Captain Tom Moore uh, in that extension. And that will give us the opportunity to extend that element uh, to a broader memorial for those lost in this unique, uh, well we hope it's unique, so far it's unique, um, a pandemic that we've experienced in our, in our lifetime. So yes, we intend to, to take that proposition of a memorial garden further forward. We had a question about whether or not um, uh, we rely on uh, charity for essential services. Um, for essential services, no, we do not. Uh, the charity is there to extend the services beyond essential to make them better. And I think there is, uh, there are two examples of that, both essentially the same. So we have decided uh, that we should have a CT scanner in each of these newly refurbished ED departments. You've seen a picture of the essentially finished ED department at Bedford. And uh, the, there's a lot of work being done on the ED department, the emergency department in Luton, and we would like to place a CT scanner on both um, in both facilities so that particularly stroke patients coming in can immediately have a CT scan and be thrombolized if that's the appropriate treatment as quickly as possible. That's just one example. Both of those have been uh, 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 essentially uh, funded uh, uh, or committed to be funded and that is a perfect example of the sort of facility that we add to the essential service of the hospital but no charity is not there for essential services it's just to make sure the service is even uh, better than uh, than they could otherwise be. We've had two questions uh, which I if Danielle's 
around and she's seen them may be best dealt with by Daniel, Daniel, Daniel Friedman to do with blood and urine tests at Bedford and uh, blood tests for working people uh, at, on two days a week at 6 a.m. Those are quite detailed questions. I don't know whether, Daniel, you can sum up and answer. Yeah, them, but, yeah. Uh, thank you, Simon. I will, I will certainly answer those two questions and, and ha have a bit of um, footage afterwards. Uh, firstly, with regard to the issues at Bedford Hospital, with regard to pathology, what would be really, really helpful if those people have had a problem, they could let Victoria know their details through uh, a confidential means because of information governance, because we can't look into the problems until we know the aspects around those samples. So we need some patient details, I'm afraid. So Victoria, I'm over to you really. If you know who um, put that question in, then certainly we will address that. And I can only apologize the second question was around a uh, Saturday morning phlebotomy, blood tests on a Saturday morning for people that work Monday to Friday or potentially had blood tests very early in the morning between 6 and 8 a.m. That is an issue we can pick up with the CCG because they've got to fund that. We're not funded to do that. And we're very fortunate. We have a very proactive uh, pathology laboratory user group, which has a terrible acronym of PLUG. Um, um, and they meet monthly, so I'll make sure that is top of the agenda because it's something we need to look at. And, and if we, even if we just do it once a month to begin with, to see what the uptake is, we don't know how many people fulfil that criteria. The third thing I wanted to say is I'm sure the public are aware. They seem to be more aware than our hospital doctors, actually, that there's a national and global shortage of blood bottles, um, which is why some of you uh, may have been told if you have regular blood tests, you may have to wait to the beginning of October. We have, uh, as I said, a national shortage of blood bottles, um, which means we're trying to preserve our blood bottles for really critical patients. Um, and then with regard to that, we have told GPs that they can, if it's an urgent, patient blood test from primary care from the GP, we will process that. So apologies again, but that's completely out of our control. And then finally, I just wanted to say and, and, and alert all the governors um, that um, in the midst of COVID, we managed to merge two completely different pathology services. David alluded to it at the beginning. One was run by the private sector and the other was, is run by the NHS. And now I'm pleased to say that all pathology from Bedfordshire Hospital is run by the NHS. So I think you cannot underestimate the work that has gone in to merging those two services, particularly in the midst of COVID. And as I'm sure you're all aware, that the laboratory is crucial in diagnosing whether you've got COVID or not. So I just want to end there, Simon, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Always those very clear answers that you give. I um, mean, we've had two other questions. We've had a lot of questions that have come in while we've been uh, going through this. Many of them have been uh, addressed by my colleagues uh, through the chat facilities, but two, I think, are still outstanding and we want to make sure that everyone is addressed. One was, I don't know who it's come from. We don't have a name against it. Does the hospital, does the Bedford Hospital, I beg your pardon, currently have any facilities for emergency treatment of suspected stroke patients? I think I know the answer, but I'd prefer the answer to come from somebody who is actually uh, closer to the service. I don't know who that would be. Would that be Kathy or Liz or Paul Teasy or whom? Can I take this one, please, Simon? Um, yeah, Kathy. So, so just to confirm um, that um, for the um, Bedfordshire and Milton Keynes populations, treatment for what we call hyperacute strokes, so um, strokes where a, a clot busting um, treatment called thrombolysis um, is required, is centralised at Luton, so that's for the whole of, of Milton Keynes and, and Bedfordshire, so ambulances will, will all go to Luton. If a patient's stroke is felt to have um, come on within a, the time span that, that makes that treatment an option, so that's called a, a fast positive stroke. Um, 
for for those uh, patients who are triaged by the ambulance crew as not being a candidate for thrombolysis, and um, then depending on acuity, they will be brought to Bedford Hospital Emergency Department and will absolutely be treated and, and admitted there according to, to need. Um, so depending on um, the acuity of the stroke and, and other clinical parameters, um, the paramedics will decide which department is most appropriate for the patient. hope that helps. Another question has come in uh, to do with uh, staff, uh, possible staff concerns, particularly at the peak of the crisis, about the quality and the scale of the PPE that was offered to them. So the question is technically, I wonder whether we had any concerns raised by staff members in regards to provisions of appropriate and stroke adequate PPE to work on the wards. And we did have uh, concerns raised. Uh, I'm sure that my colleagues will step in and uh, ensure to the, the, you that we addressed them as well as we could possibly could but there were people obviously who were worried about the extraordinary uh, uh, roles that they were playing and you know at the margin the risks that they were taking and wanted to be appropriately protected who who again will fill that out you want that me to that Simon? yeah this is the kathy jones show no, it's Liz, actually <laughs> Oh, Liz, I beg me. your pardon. I didn't catch the <laughs> cadence of the voice. Liz, please. I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up. So just to um, just to be clear, while there was, you know, the provision of PPE at the beginning of the pandemic was very tight. We managed it very carefully. Uh, we, need, we didn't run out of PPE in the hospital. One of the challenges we faced was the we and we followed the guidance that was issued on a national perspective, which did change through the pandemic. And I think um, that was one of the challenges we had um, with making staff feel safe. Um, what wasn't that we'd run out, it's just we were following the national guidance and I think um, some of the teams found that difficult to manage. I think as we got into a bit more and, and it was new and this was this was a very scary time for our staff. We, we touched on that already. So I think once we got into a bit more of a rhythm of the use of PPE and um, we were allowing staff to multi-professional teams to make risk-based assessment on the best use of PPE and the level of PPE for the clinical circumstances they were in. And actually that really helped reassure staff. Right, at this point, I don't think we've got any questions that have come we, in. Um, sorry, Simon, on. to interrupt your flow. There were two but questions okay, that we on. didn't get to answer, particularly around IT issues. Um, I think Jill's on the line to be able to deal with those. It was about Bedford and Luton hospitals being able to see each other's reports and scans and the impact of the electronic patient record and how this will affect patient care. Um, so I think I think we have Jill. There's so many people on there, I'm not sure. Yes, hi. There hi. she is. Good Thanks, evening. Jill. Yes, looking in the background. Um, yeah, just to answer the first question about accessibility of results between the two sites, um, we've increasingly um, made that more and more possible over the since the merger. It is still a little clunky for the um, staff at both sites to see both sets of records, but they can do that. Increasingly, though, we are making that easier. There is new solutions coming out over the next few months. And ultimately, we will move to, I think we've said a number of times, a single set of systems um, across both sites, which will eventually mean there is no need to bridge it. But um, all clinicians can get access to both sets of results. Um, and at some point in the future, we will um, also be making patients' um, results accessible to them. So that's over the, you know, the future, um, sort of, uh, several months. But there's plans ahead to improve things. But to repeat, the clinicians do have access to both sets of results, an individual clinician. The second question about electronic patient record. Luton has for many years had the patient records um, digitised, so the, the paper has been held in electronic form, which has enabled uh, uh, clinicians to get access to paper across the hospital in an electronic, uh, by electronic access. Bedford has recently completed a similar project, so it's in a very similar state. The next levels of the uh, digital strategy will move away from having electronic bits of paper to capturing 
information in a more structured way and that again will enable us to add more capability to supporting things like decision making some of the operational processes and making them more efficient and be able to plan uh, more effectively and let the system support that planning and ultimately with an aim of increasing patient safety further and also giving, improving the patient safety. So to repeat, um, all records are now held electronically, um, like an electronic piece of paper. Eventually they'll be held in a more structured fashion to allow enhanced um, support to the, uh, the processes that the expert teams um, use around the trust. Hope in two seconds I've answered those questions, but very happy to uh, give more insight into that at any point. You are mute, Simon. Good. I was being so good that I was too good for my own good. Um, uh, yes, we often talk about uh, the redevelopment of the sites, particularly the acute services block on the Luton site, as being transformational to what we can achieve for patients. But I think while you don't see it in the same way, the uh, effort that uh, Jill and her team are putting in to re-energizing or refashioning the digital offering and making sure that not just patients can see, but GPs will be able to see uh, the, 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 the medical staff across the uh, two hospitals will be able to see uh, records as people come in and, uh, 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 and dynamically is possibly as important. Uh, and seriously, uh, serious sums of money are being spent on it. So I think it's a good question to have asked and it gives me the opportunity. I think it's about £10 million pounds per annum on enhancing uh, digital and as Matt uh, dares contradict me. You know, it's, around, it's around that level, isn't it, Matt? No? Yes, yes it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, look, um, we have come to the end of the submitted questions. Uh, uh, if people want to sub submit further questions uh, through, uh, through the uh, chat facility or more dynamically by raising their hand, I see one now we've done, uh, then we've got a few more minutes for those questions. Elizabeth. Easy often to raise your hand, but one has to Turn the microphone on. Um, no. Elizabeth, can we come back to you? But in the meantime, I see a hand that's gone up from Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, I think in the chairman's part, um, integrated care uh, and the movement to an ICS and integrated care services. But no nowhere in the presentation was there any indication as how you were going to deliver integrated care and who you were going to deliver it with. I just wondered how important it was for the hospital uh, and when we'll start seeing some focus on the integration of care across the NHS and within the wider social care community. Shall I pick that I'm up just going on? to start with an introduction to that, but as David's already suggested, he should take the body of that question, uh, uh, partly because he is the man who leads the Bedfordshire Care Alliance, which is probably the principal vehicle by which we will do that. I think integrated care has a number of different facets. There's integrated uh, care of people who are ill, uh, and then there's the broader subject of integrated care, which is to make sure uh, that people don't get ill in the first place and integration of the way in which social services and, uh, and, 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 and the local authorities conduct themselves to prevent illness in the first place. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's a very big subject and we are not going to be able uh, in the hospital to deliver uh, the whole of that. But David, you, 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 you take this, the question. Yeah, uh, it, this is a, uh, um, a very, very important for us and um, just my definition of what integrated what we mean by integrated care is at the moment uh, for many patients we as an acute hospital do our bit for a patient we, we might see them in outpatients or they might be admitted to hospital um, for many of those patients there will also be 
in receipt of perhaps a care package by the local authority. They'll be under their GP. They might perhaps also be um, involved with, with mental health and so on. And we all do our individual bits pretty much in isolation. And what integration means to me is that we try and do that in a much more coordinated fashion. And so some of the ways that we're involved in trying to make that happen is, for example, I chair the Bedfordshire uh, Digital Transformation Board. And what's that going to do is that it's, it's, it's reason for existence is to allow all of the clinicians and professionals within the system to see all of the, 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 the interactions that they have with the, with the patient. So that when a, a patient arrives in the, in the A&E department, we can see whether they have a care package. We can see what's going on with their, their, their interaction with the mental health trust. When a, a district nurse visits a patient in their own home, they can see exactly what's going on. And so that means that we, that's what I mean by integrated care. The other, the other part of that, I mean, I mentioned making the, the digital record work, which allows that to happen. But um, uh, last week I was um, at the groundbreaking ceremony for the Dunstable Hub. The Dunstable Hub is a development which will bring together primary care, mental health, social services and ourselves. And we've taken a really active role in the Dunstable Hub. We're not going to be the, the key leaseholder of that building. And the reason why that's important to integrated care is actually when people are working together in the same building, it makes it much easier to provide that that um, that that proper multidisciplinary view of, view, of, view of an individual. Whereas at the moment that's being done in multiple different um, um, places within the within the system. We we definitely see our role as the biggest um, health provider in the system as, as as leading this and taking an active role. And and those are two examples: the digital strategy where I chair that board, but also the uh, Dunstable Hub and the, the, the rollout of hubs across Bedfordshire, where we uh, will be taking a leading role in the uh, procurement and delivery of those hubs. David's alluded to, we had a request from a, uh, a significant local politician to get involved in yet another hub only at about lunchtime today. Uh, the hub strategy is critical. Uh, Elizabeth, have you cracked your technology and can you come in with your question? We can see you waving your hand and we can see your mouth moving, but we can't hear anything. Elizabeth has put a message in the chat saying someone's muting us, so maybe we need to... Um... Are we muting you? Oh, you, yeah. you? I think you're good now, Elizabeth, go. Yes. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. My question was the one about um, reducing ill health and the uh, expansion of fast food restaurants. And you mentioned this, but I wasn't quite sure where this fitted in um, the, the various hospital groups and whether this was actually going to be taken on board. Because uh, reducing ill health. It's much better, let, as you let, said. Let, then. Me, let me take that. Start. Okay. We uh, have some fast food restaurants in the hospital, and we are, again, as we reopen those, because those have been closed in large part by virtue of uh, uh, the work we've been doing in the hospital, but we are determined to offer a better range of facilities in our own restaurants. But I don't think that's what you meant. No, it's not. <laughs> so I was slightly ducking the question. Elizabeth, after you've been uh, diligent. Well, it. when I, I moved I to, to, to David for a fuller answer. Um, yes. When I moved here, there was one fast food uh, pizza restaurant near here. We now have three with four, and this is just towards the end of our road, four proposed extra ones. And this is not just happening here, it's happening all round Bedford. And one of the things that means that more people consume this sort of food is availability. Yeah, I mean, I think this is largely... Afraid our local system. council is making it too available. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point. You're beginning to answer the question yourself, but just, uh, we have other questions coming in, but David, maybe you right. can end on a little yes. answer to herself. We we are part of, um, as a hospital, we're part of three different groups for each of the local boroughs. In fact, I was on a 
workshop today with Luton Borough Council um, about what they call their place board, which is about how how we come together as as that brings together all the people who work in Luton. Um, and so that's that's the place where that should happen, and that links into the local health and wellbeing board. So we, as a provider of healthcare, can't influence that very much, but we do see the problems associated with it. In fact, we're obviously, as you may know, we're the biggest provider of bariatric surgery in the country. Um, but the the problem of obesity uh, affects all of our services. So the way that that should work is that we are highlighting that to uh, the local authority through the health and wellbeing board and through the place based group. They then have the responsibility to try and tackle that through their public health team and through potentially their any levers that they might have in relation to planning legislation. But we as a hospital have very few direct influence or direct levers that we can can do this. But we are we are definitely trying to influence uh, through those that are links with the local authorities. Simon, you're muted. I have a question that's coming. Thank you, Elizabeth. We've had a question from Mary France Capon, who is a governor. Uh, she asked what's happening uh, in relation to end of life patients at the L&D if they don't go into the Keech uh, Hospice. Um, who, who, who can deal with end of life at the L&D? Uh, Liz can pick that up. Liz. Thanks, Simon. I have just put a quick reply in the, in ah. the chat box, but but that, but that's fine. I, I mean, a large proportion of, of people will, will still, unfortunately, die in hospital. Um, what we try and do um, is we've got now I've got a seven day palliative care service, which is something we started in the pandemic as well to recognise that we needed that seven day service rather than just five days. We End of life care is a real focus for us as a as a priority, and we have now got really pleased to say we've got fifteen volunteers that are trained as butterfly volunteers, which we got, which was a, something we got through charitable funds um, to help support families and patients at their end of life. And we're just about to launch that. We've got fifteen volunteers that have been trained. Where possible, we try and get people home to their care home, uh, to their preferred place of care, and sometimes that may be the hospice if there's a bed available. Um, but we, we work with families, and that's what the palliative care team do. I'm not aware of any other questions that are coming in, but I'm not seeing the, uh, the, 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 the chat room, as others may be. Um, it's not obligatory to extend this by asking questions. Uh, uh, we've tried, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure that we anticipated questions, and therefore the presentation in this virtual annual members meeting was such that we anticipated questions and we told you openly what we've been up to. So I'm not uh, critical of, of, of no further questions. I mean, I would just conclude uh, by saying this is a year, uh, frankly, I, I think like no other that this hospital uh, or pair of hospitals has experienced. Um, uh, partly, as we said, by virtue of coming together, partly by virtue of accommodating the biggest pandemic we, 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 we know, and partly as a result of um, uh, the change in the working practices that you've just been alluding to in your, in your uh, questions that we have. A, we are assuming essentially a greater responsibility outside the boundaries of a conventional hospital. Um, and I, I, I think as, uh, as we end, uh, it's only appropriate to, uh, to again pass tribute to those people who've made the year in the context of those challenges as successfully as I think it could reasonably have been expected to have been, if you see what I mean. I have not, uh, as chair, been into the wards for about 18 months since the COVID uh, pandemic started, but under supervision uh, last Friday, I did so, uh, and I was, uh, I have to say, amazed, and it's possible I'll get quite emotional about this, by the strength of the resilience and the good humour of people who have committed themselves, not just in terms of the hours that they've worked, but exposed themselves to risks that most of us in this uh, in this meeting have not had to do and we've talked about the PPE but they've exposed themselves and through themselves they've exposed their families and uh, 
that they're still standing and that they're still prepared to smile and give us the time of day, I think is frankly remarkable. So thank you very much for participating in this. Um, I hope uh, I will be around uh, uh, to say goodbye myself uh, at the next annual members meeting. But uh, until then, uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for all the support you give us. Sometimes that support comes from governors in the form of making sure that we are aware that we're not fulfilling our duties in the way that we fully should. Uh, and I thank you for that as well. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, but particularly, let's thank the staff.